understand where inequality came from, Diamond needed to identify a time before inequality, when people across the world were living more or less the same way. He had to turn back the clock thousands of years, back before the first civilizations, back into prehistory. Thirteen thousand years ago, the ravages of the last ice age were over. The world was becoming warmer and wetter. One area where humans were thriving was the Middle East. Thirteen thousand years ago, the Middle East was far less arid than today, with more forests, trees, and plants. People here lived like people everywhere at this time, as hunter-gatherers in small, mobile groups. They were frequently on the move, making shelters wherever they could find animals to hunt or plants to gather. They'd live in these shelters for weeks or months at a time, as long as they could keep feeding themselves. But as seasons changed and animals migrated, they'd move on to the next valley or ridge looking for new sources of food. One of the few places on Earth where it's still possible to find people hunting and gathering is the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Instead of just reading about this lifestyle in archaeological books, I've been lucky enough to witness it firsthand, to see for myself how we all lived 13,000 years ago, and how we found food. To catch an animal requires skill, stealth, and encyclopedic knowledge about hundreds of animal species. You have to be pretty smart to be a hunter. Thirteen thousand years ago, people in the Middle East hunted in the same way, tracking down whatever game they could find. But the fundamental problem with hunting is that it's never been a productive way to find enough food. It takes time to track each animal. And with a bow and arrow, there's no certainty of how the hunt will end. One of something. You know, can lap. You try and get. Okay. Pull him. Okay. One time more. Yes. <laughs> One so time you pull him strong. Me pull him strong. Yeah, me. Yeah, you pull him strong and by go more yet. Yeah. Me, me play broken bowl. Bowl. No, you. God, yeah, you not strong. Em, <laughs> <laughs> you not strong, yeah. Me no strong. What of something. So you pull him strong. Time All right. And me go me pull him strong. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Me paid him one fella, D.Y. D.Y. died in us. You number one, me number two. Me try, me go, go, go. Because hunting is so unpredictable, traditional societies have usually relied more on gathering. In this part of Papua New Guinea, the gathering is done by women. An important source of food here is wild sago. By stripping a sago tree, they can get to the pulp at the center, which can be turned into a dough and then cooked. Although it's physically harder work, Gathering is generally a more productive way of finding food than hunting. But it still doesn't provide enough calories to support a large population. 
this jungle around us, you might think it's a cornucopia, but it isn't. Most of these trees in the jungle don't yield, don't give us anything edible. There are just a few sago trees, and the rest of these trees don't yield anything that we could eat. And then sago itself has got limitations. One tree yields only maybe about 70 pounds of sago. It takes them three or four days to process that tree. So it's a lot of work really for not a great deal of food. Plus the sago starch is low on protein. And also the sago can't be stored for a long time. And that's why hunter-gatherer populations are so sparse. If you want to feed a lot of people, you've got to find a different food supply. You've got to find a really productive environment, and it's not going to be a sago swamp. In the Middle East, there were very different plants to gather. Growing wild between the trees were two cereal grasses, barley and wheat far more plentiful and nutritious than sago. These simple grasses would have a profound impact, setting humanity on a course towards modern civilization. But it would take a catastrophic change in the climate before this would happen. Twelve and a half thousand years ago, the world's climate became highly volatile. The long-term thaw that had brought about the end of the last ice age suddenly went into reverse. Global temperatures dropped and ice age conditions returned. The world became colder and drier. The Middle East suffered an environmental collapse. Animal herds died off. So did many trees and plants. The drought lasted for more than a thousand years. People were forced to travel farther and look much harder to find any source of food. But despite the conditions, they would somehow survive and even prosper. Here in the Middle East, a new way of life would come into being, one that would change the face of the earth. Ian Kite is a Canadian archaeologist who specializes in the Stone Age history of the Middle East. His work is focused on a site in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea, a place known as Dra. Kite is a co-director of the dig and works with an international team of archaeologists. They've uncovered the remains of ancient dwellings that were clearly more sophisticated than any hunter-gatherer shelters. They believe this was a small village, one of the earliest permanent villages anywhere in the world. People were starting to put down roots. What we would have had was this village of, I don't know, 40 to 50 people living in the same place. We would have had a series of oval huts that would have been partially cut into the ground. Uh, and these would have been very much the the first time people settled down and lived in communities in a really extensive way. When they radiocarbon dated the site, they discovered that the village first emerged 11 and a half thousand years ago, at the same time as the end of the drought in the Middle East. But how was it possible to feed an entire village if times were so hard? After four years of digging at Dra, the archaeologists believe they have an answer. It lies in this unique structure. 